Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I have Dr. De Raymond Damadian on our uh, TV show today. He is our, the inventor of the MRI. Welcome, Dr. Damadian. Uh, this is my co-host, Rich Gear, and uh, we have uh, visited you, uh, I think it was three times two years ago, and uh, we were able to interview you at that time about uh, about uh, your invention of the MRI. We uh, welcome you again to our show, and uh, thank you for joining us. Great to see you again, Doc. Yeah. It's great to see you. Yeah. And we, we wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit today about the, uh, the current state of your technology uh, of, uh, of the Phonar machine. And uh, you have a development of the uh, MRI that is uh, different than most of the MRIs that are uh, on the market to, uh, in, in the past and uh, probably the ones that we're familiar with. From the perspective of our company, we have two active territories. One is the cerebrospinal fluid flow where because with the MRI is enabled us to make pictures of movies of the cerebrospinal fluid and more importantly to measure the flow in cc's per second which nobody could ever do before and what we find is that when we restore the flow to normal the patients get better and that's one dimension and the other dimension is the one that I'm looking forward to in the uh, in the near future where we can use the MRI pictures because what the MRI allows medicine to do that it could never do before is look at the critical soft tissues of the body and see them in detail. Now, how would that be fruitful? Well, if, if you were making an image of somebody's tumor, what you're now able to do is by looking at the image you can monitor the treatment of the patient's cancer. Is the cancer responding to treatment or isn't it? And what you're now in a position to do is customize the treatment. What do I mean by that? Well, in general, what gets happening uh, to, in medicine in general is that there's a general solution to the problem and all patients get the same treatment irrespective yeah. of their particular symptomatology. But what the MRI now makes possible is you can look at the patient's lesion and see whether or not the lesion is with the images is responding to the treatment they're giving. Are, giving, are they giving the right drugs? Are they giving the right doses? Uh, or should it be switched to another treatment? You're now in a position to monitor uh, that lesion and how it is responding to the treatment. So the doctors can customize the treatment for that particular patient. Well, that, that's a really uh, excellent way to monitor a person's uh, cancer if, there, if that is a, an issue. Now, uh, Doug, is to figure out a way uh, that we can perform these images and monitor the patient's lesion and determine uh, the extent to which it's uh, responding to treatment. That, that's, that's, what, that's what the MRI makes possible today that you could never do before because the MRI sees the soft tissues of the body in incredible detail where x-ray doesn't see it at all. Ah, we have this power to monitor the treatment that didn't exist before. And you're able to do it kind of in short bursts. I remember a lot of times the MRI, you, you'd be in the MRI well, the tunnel or whatever it was for quite a while, but once you get a certain baseline, you can kind of do short uh, re-scans that are kind of allows you to see the progress. As I remember when we went out to your place before, we were seeing some of those pictures, and they were like very short, very short scans, and they were able to see immediately if there was progress or not on some of the cancers. MRI allows you to put the patient in any position, and what that means is you can ask the patient to put themselves in the position that generates the pain. Because if you don't have them in the right position, you may not see the pathology at all. But now because we have the upright multi-position MRI machine, which is the Phonar product, you can now put the patient in the position that the patient says is generating the pain. And uh, you can determine whether or not you're getting a successful result when you treat them. 
What led to uh, uh, the invention of the upper right MRI? How is that different than the uh, one where you're... Uh, the conventional one that we laid down. Well, we, we were asked by people when we had built the MRI, uh, was it possible to do it upright? Uh, because they were concerned about the ability to uh, see their own symptomatology, and uh, uh, we thought we could do that nicely. That, that our our magnet technology was different from everybody else's, allowed us to do that. So you figured out a way to do the magnet. Now, do you still uh, super cool them? Our, our our magnets are not super cool. Uh, we don't we don't we don't have the liquid helium needs. How did that come about with that you don't have to super cool it anymore? I'm curious as to that, because that's what we... We, just, we wanted to uh, overcome that, and so we developed the technology that allowed us to do it uh, without the uh, super cool liquid helium. You are the only uh, company that uh, does not need the super cool technology. Is that correct? No, well, we're, we're also working on... Uh, a superconducting technology, so that that's something in the works right now. Okay, so a different kind of to superconducting. Okay, so uh, tell us a little bit about our your uh, a little bit more of the the history of, of uh, uh, MRI and uh, how you uh, came about uh, originally with uh, with the idea. I know you went through a lot of different blind alleys in the beginning. Uh, trying to find the cure for cancer. So uh, why don't you uh, uh, give us a little bit more of that uh, that story. The, the way it, it sort of got started, I had some GI difficulties. And when I consulted the physicians, uh, they said, well, uh, come on in. We've got to uh, do a laparotomy and open you to see what the difficulty is. I said, wait a minute. I have some GI distress, and the only way you can diagnose is to cut me open? And I went to several uh, surgeons, and they all said the same thing. I said, gee, we've got to do better than that. There's got to be a way to find out what the uh, difficulties is without cutting somebody open. So uh, I began thinking about ways to go about doing that. And then I had the occasion to operate. Uh, I was doing, I was initially in my initial work, I was focused on the electricity I call it the electricity of life, the extraordinary phenomenon that the living individual is a con ed plant generating his own electricity, which is really quite extraordinary. And then when life comes to men, uh, the con ed plant shuts off and your voltage goes from 90 millivolts to zero millivolts. So I was, I was focused on how does the living cell generate that electricity? And the answer is that it accumulates the potassium ion atom, which is charged. And it, there's a high potassium inside the cell and a low outside. And if you put those two amounts into a standard battery equation, you get the voltage uh, of life. You see what the voltage of life is. It's coming from what we call the gradation or the gradient of the potassium inside, which is 140 millimoles, uh, where the potassium outside, which is four millimoles, and take those two numbers and, and put them in a battery equation, that is where the voltage of life, the electricity of life, is coming from. Well, that, that's amazing. And, and you, uh, you came up with the idea of using NMR technology to detect this, correct? Exactly. I came up with the idea to use NMR technology to hunt down uh, deposits wherever they might be in the body and, and, and do it critically non-invasively. And the other beautiful thing that NMR added was uh, unlike x-ray where you'd have to, you, you, you couldn't repeat the x-ray because you're ionizing radiation on the patient and you have to wait, you know, two, three weeks before you repeat it. In principle, you could do the patient in an MRI machine because it's completely harmless. You could do them every day. You could do them three times a day. So you had this new power to, number one, to see these soft tissues of the body, which are all the vital organs that x-ray technology could never see in detail. And indeed, you can actually do M uh, MRI video using your technology. We, we make movies of the patient going through flexion and extension. And, and we, uh, we 
produce that as as a motion video. How, did, how does that actually work? Work or is it too complicated on a show like this to, to do? I'm just trying because everything else has been a, a still picture, uh, and now you've got able to do video footage, no, no. movie. How, how does that work? You can have the patient say do a flexion and extension. I see. And you can take snapshots as he's doing it. So then you play the snapshots back, and you got a video. Well, I mean, I remember you were talking about, and I, with with my own wife, we did some things with the uh, the cerebral spinal fluid. When you have a lot of a lot of pathologies caused by uh, lesions or things from the fluid that's flowing, but you can actually see the fluid leaking into the brain, or you can see the positions where it's changing, and uh, that video allows that to happen. What I was going to show you, and I, if I can get us to bring it up, uh, I, we make movies of the cerebrospinal fluid going in and out of the brain. Yeah, that's amazing to me. And I, and I can show you the pictures of it if I get my guys to uh, do it. Only let me do one. Oh, all right. All right, that's one. All Which right. one do you want first, sir? Well, show that one. Now, um, what you can see here on this picture is the spinal cord coming down from the brain. You can you can see the uh, I'll show it to you. This is the spinal cord coming down here, and you see the cerebrospinal fluid going in and out of the brain, and you see it on the back of the cord, and you see it on the front of the cord. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see All it. All right. Now, now I'm going to show you alongside of it the patient that has multiple sclerosis. Right click. Right click. Yeah, go ahead. You move. You don't want to move it. And you see, when you look at that black streak coming down, yep. in a patient with multiple sclerosis, you only see it in the front of the cord. You don't see it in the back of the cord because it's obstructed. Yep. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now... <clears throat> We, we have a Parkinson's patient. I, can I get to that somehow? We have a Parkinson's patient where we measured the cerebrospinal fluid flow on a Parkinson's patient. For one. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it right yes. there. Can I show that one? Okay. Take, now, this is a Parkinson's patient, and I don't know if you can see these numbers, but the three columns on the right are the quantified CSF flow, which is circulating from the brain to the tailbone during 32 quarts a day. And when we did her uh, the first time before she was treated, her CSF flow was half of normal. <clears throat> and we found a malalignment of the craniocervical junction. So I took her to Dr. Rosa, who is our expert on this, and he, using the Atlas orthogonal technology, he realigned her C1 and C2. And I don't know if you can see it, but her CSF flow doubled. And it was back to normal after he realigned her. So I called her up and I said, gee, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to report to you that we have doubled your cerebrospinal fluid flow. And I said, the question I want to ask you, did it make any difference in your Parkinson's uh, trembling symptoms? And her answer, which surprised me, astounded me, is I'm cured. And, uh, and, and her symptoms of the, the, the shaking in her hand were gone. Now, about a year and a half later, her symptoms came back. We realigned her craniocervical junction, and uh, um, it, it, her Parkinson's symptoms went away. So what, what, what I'm showing you here is not just what I showed you in the movies of the cerebrospinal fluid, going in and out alongside the spinal cord, but I'm showing you the additional power to measure it in cc's per second, which is worth its weight in gold. It definitely is a promising technology. Now, uh, what can be done to make this um, treatment and uh, technology mainstream? Because obviously the with the number of F phone or F upright MRIs in the world, especially in Michigan, I don't think there are any. And uh, the 
of course, Dr. Rosa is uh, just one person. So uh, you know, we would like to see uh, this be become uh, more of a standard treatment. Uh, what is blocking that? Now, this is a list of all those neurodegenerative diseases, and, and it's a big list. And, and the, the cerebrospinal fluid is having an enormous role here. Um, and here they are, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, childhood autism, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, and, and we're seeing obstruction of the CSF flow in all these patients. And when we realign them, uh, we, we, we often have a dramatic response. But how do you get a re how do you get it realigned? Because uh, I mean, we've taken like uh, we've taken we've taken three, three trips out there, but it's yeah. kind of difficult to get Carol out to New York for one. And yeah, I know you're it's asking not how do we do the realignment? Yeah, you're looking at the craniocervical junction, and this is the dense bone right here uh, of C two, and it's going into C one. But the thing to recognize is you have these transverse processes, this transverse process sticking out on the left, and this transverse process sticking out on the right. And if you use this AA, AO technology, which I'll show you a picture of that Dr. Rosa does all the time, uh, you can tap on that and put it back into its uh, necessary orientation. So um, here's the technology right here. And Dr. Rosa, our atlas orthogonal, will take that probe and put it right on the skin, and he's just millimeters away from that transverse process that I showed you. And he'll, he'll put that bone that's rotated 30 degrees right back in alignment, and it, has a, it, it, it often has a dramatic impact on the cerebrospinal fluid flow. So you need to get this machine in Michigan. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's our problem, is uh, how do we get uh, 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 someone here in Michigan trained on, on this equipment and uh, follow Dr. Rosa's pr pr procedures and, and to get a upright MRI in Michigan. Yeah. The people who invest in it are going to find themselves in a, in a, in a very profitable situation because uh, one of these scanners can generate as much as $3 million a year in, rev in uh, revenue, in, in gross revenue. I was just wondering if it's been adopted by Mayo in Minnesota. Uh, does the Mayo clinic? I don't think so. Okay, I was just asking, I'm a patient there. A patient. Doug, I wasn't sure whether I should, whether I can talk yet or not. Uh, that'd be fine, yes. Uh, you can ask Okay. Questions. Well, you didn't introduce me at the beginning, so I thought that my picture might not even be on the on the screen. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Demedian, this is Steve Schwartz. Uh, he's uh, the, well, he uh, manages the Creation Moments uh, uh, Facebook page. And so he is a, a, a creation scientist. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. What, what is that, Steve? I work with the Creation Moments uh, radio ministry. Oh, okay. It's involved with uh, uh, creation. Yeah, wonderful. And what's the question, Steve? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very active in that area. Well, um, actually, I, got, uh, I became the, uh, very personally interested in your topic because I have MS, and uh, it's progressing. It's, uh, and I was just wondering whether I could, how I would go about seeking well, I, the know, kind of... I have of a bunch of slides here, which I was showing on it. Um, th that's what you guys call a revolution against evolution, and I'm 1,000% I'm on your side. And I have a bunch of slides if I can show them to you. I'd love to see them. But I don't want to take us but, off topic. But, oh, here. Well, uh, let me, th this, is, this is worth your seeing here. This is... Um, a multiple sclerosis patient, and you see the lesions before the patient was realigned by Dr. Rosa. And then you see the same patient after the realignment, and you see the lesions are gone away in, in yeah. the patient. You see the same thing here, a lesion there. 
Um, and here you see the lesion, and after treatment, the lesion is gone. This is breakthrough. And, and, and here, there's, there's a lesion before treatment, and after the patient was treated and realigned by Dr. Rosa, the lesion is gone, or dramatically reduced, depending on how you want to uh, discuss it. And, and here's the same thing. The lesion before treatment, uh, where the patient's craniocervical junction was realigned, and the obstructions for the CSF flow is eliminated, and there's a dramatic improvement in the lesion. And here, you see a lesion in the spinal cord before treatment, and the lesion in the spinal cord is gone after you realign the craniocervical junction. Do you have an opening uh, coming up soon? <laughs> I volunteer. Let, let me come on up to where, where you are. Dan, I'm not and treat me. <laughs> I didn't, oh, I didn't. so aggravating with the sound, the volume. So what's the question, Steve? Can I be a patient? <laughs> Can he, what? He would like to become a patient. He wants to be a patient for, with Dr. Rose. Oh, okay. Well, I think the first, is it Steve, you're asking that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the first thing to do, Steve, that's important, is to get upright MRI pictures of you so we know exactly what the difficulty is. Because then we know... Uh, once we know exactly what the difficulty is from your anatomy, then we know exactly the, the, the treatment procedure that Dr. Rose has to do. So the first thing to do is get pictures. I would love to do that. Does insurance pay for it? Yeah, sure. Of course. No. Can I get on your schedule? What was that? Can I get on your schedule? Sure. Just call up. Just call me up and ask for my secretary, Ellen, and tell her that Dr. Demadian wants to scan you. So uh, what, what, what kind of symptoms do you have, Steve? Hello? Doug, can you give his phone number? Yeah. So uh, I can get you in touch right. with him. I'm going to give it to you right now. 631-694-2929. And ask for my assistant. Ellen is her first name, and her last name is... Yeske, Y-E-S-K-E, -E, and tell her that Dr. Demadian wants her to schedule a scan for Steve. And we'll do the scan, okay. and we'll know exactly what, what, what kind of symptoms do you, have you been having, Steve? If you're able, you don't have to uh, tell me. Oh, but I, I can go into, into that in more detail, but I have the uh, PPMS. The what? Would it be the same for our PPMS as... R-R-M-S? I'm not hearing the word, Steve. I'm sorry. Okay. What? I have primary progressive MS. So. Uh, P yeah, well, you need a scan, okay? And we'll okay. know exactly what the difficulty is when we do the scan. Okay. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good chance that we, um, you know, I'm naturally hopeful. And once we see what you have, uh, we'll be able to reverse it by treating you with the Dr. Rosa realignment of your craniocervical junction. That's my hypothesis. Well, I'd be happy to uh, participate. So just set up, just set up an appointment with Ellen, and uh, you come here, and we'll scan you on the upright MRI, and we'll know. Okay, Dr. Demeda, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you became a young earth creationist because that's that's kind of our show a little bit i love i love talking about all, all about the mri stuff but i'm i'm really interested too about your your journey as a creation person because i know you're you've really been uh, you've taken some some hits because of it and i know that it's not always been smooth sailing because of it so uh, I, I just want to hear some of your thoughts on on the creation movement and or creationism itself and uh, what, what you find, maybe your, your place in it is, you know? As you go from a slime mold and steadily have this set of accidents, so you, you, you evolve from an ape with 400 cc's of brain and you become a human being with 1,200 cc's of brain, you have to be able to show some evidence that you came from a 400 cc uh, brain uh, chimpanzee. And the only uh, proof of that is you have to be able to show some intermediate life forms that show the transition, and they don't exist. 
Yeah, I find that in many of the uh, biggest, uh, the most, I'd say, proven tenets of science, evolution seems to be diametrically opposite of it. For another instance, for me, evolution to even occur, you have to have something non-living to turn into something living, okay? And self-replicating, and everything, in, or something non-living, and life always comes from life, that's the law of biogenesis, abiogenesis, life never comes from non-life. Is it's devastating our country. It's having an impact on our, our national philosophy. It's, it's a disaster. Yes, we've seen that with it, with uh, a lot of stuff that's going on there. The, for years and years, the progression of 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 uh, well, violence and antipathy towards Christianity, especially, but to, to uh, things because we've been, we've been taught for 150 years in this country that basically we evolved from non-life and it was incrementally stepped upward and the hand of God was not involved in it. Some ministers made the mistake of trying to co-opt it and say, well, God did it or started it or caused it to happen. But it, it, so many of the, of the premises of evolution seem to be opposite of science. The idea that, uh, well, the increase in genetic information at every step of the way, you mentioned there's, there seems to be breaks between, there's no transitions. I, I call it science fiction. I call yeah. evolution science fiction. There's no evidence for it. Yet, how has it got to be the the ascendant philosophy? Is it just because of the hard hardest of, of humans, or what? That's an interesting question, and I think I, I've pondered that many times. How did it ever get accepted? And I think the only thing I can conclude is that the scientific academic world at, uh, at that time um, was doing the basic practice of science is to do experiments and see results. And um, it, it's a materialistic technology. So from that, from that perspective where, uh, uh, and it avoids the power and the, and the significance of a supreme being. So you no longer have to comply uh, with the laws of the supreme being. Now you can do anything you want, and you can indulge you can indulge any lust you want because you've just been liberated by evolution. That with the recognition that you are simply an accident. Well, uh, we are running out of time right now, but uh, uh, it was uh, really uh, uh, nice to. Uh, uh, interview you again, Dr. Damanian.